two years ago, there were what are now called the Black Summer Fires. They started here in early November in 2019, um, within about three hours. Um, you couldn't see anything except smoke. The fire was only a couple of kilometers away. The wind change went into another direction, but for three months, for November, December, and January, um, we ended up with fires all around us. We evacuated a few times, but finally, there was nowhere safe to evacuate to, and the roads were a lot more dangerous than staying here where we've got some fire protection, but also the animals needed us. We kept up a food and water station for the animals, and I have never known anything like it. Animals that usually eat each other, tolerated each other. We spent all day, we had to ember watch because the fires were so close. Um, great burning embers kept on falling from the sky. We'd have to put them out before they formed fires. I would stay up till about three o'clock in the morning. Then my husband would get up and he would ember watch for the rest of the time. And there was no daylight and there was no nighttime. The sky was blazing red, so you didn't need a torch at night. But you could only ever see a couple of meters away because of the black smoke. And there were so many animals. There were wombats, there were wallabies, there were quolls, um, there were powerful owls, there were brush-tailed possums, there were ring-tailed possums, there were sugar gliders, there were kangaroos, there were three different kinds of wallabies. I won't even go into the number of animals. And they were all eating together, including um, a black snake who was just eating among the possums. And all of the animals were tolerating each other. But one night in early January, about two o'clock in the morning, I was out replenishing the food. And suddenly I saw coming out of the smoke a small, totally black wombat just staggering towards the water. She was starving. I could see her ribs. Her paws were so covered with charcoal. It was just charcoal embedded in them. And she managed a few more steps and she just collapsed. She couldn't get to the water. She was just too weak. She must have been traveling for days across country, which had been burnt to get here to the only place where there was fresh water. So I carried fresh water over to her, I put it under her nose, and very, very slowly, just lifting up handfuls of water to her mouth, very slowly, she lapped the water. And after about two hours, she was strong enough to get to her feet and walk over to the food and water station. And there were hundreds of animals there, including wild whiskers. Wild whiskers is a wombat who lives here and who is the nastiest, meanest animal I have ever, ever met. Wild whiskers will work behind the bush and try and bite me. She will bite any wallaby who tries to bound past her. Even wild whiskers stepped back. All of these animals, the quolls, the wallabies, the possums, they all move back like that. So this starving, weak little wombat could get to the water and get to the food. She was too weak to go very far for the first couple of days. Um, she sheltered, in fact, just exactly there, just outside my study, um, in the shade of the wall. And I kept on taking out food and water. And then after two days of eating and drinking, she was strong enough to share Phil's burrow. Now, Phil's burrow is just over there, underneath the pomegranate tree. And Phil is the sweetest, nicest, wombat you have ever met. Phil was reared by humans. Um, 
He'd had um, a dislocated shoulder, a dislocated paw. He went through surgery after surgery for a year. Um, no one had ever done surgery like that on a wombat just so he could walk again. And because at the end of that time, he just loved humans. He loves being cuddled. He loves being scratched. So Phil was put here so he could be a wild wombat, but he still had the human he loved around him. He had a wallaby. I have no idea how many other animals were sharing his burrow, but he also shared his burrow with the little fire wombat. And every night after that, the fire wombat just came out with all of the other animals and she ate and she drank. And there was wonderfully closed because of the bushfire and there was no way we could feed all of those animals we couldn't get out to buy food um there were no deliveries um no trucks were delivering to this area um the roads were only open for very short periods but every time they were there were cars there were utes and they were piled with sacks of carrots um sacks of corn sacks of sweet potato bales of loosen um loosen and other grain pellets um pears apples um wonderful it's like a great big buffet for for possums there was celery there were parsnips the possums had never had such wonderful food in their life um some of the Sikh community in melbourne drove up to a local town and just gave away free meals to every and we also had the magic fringe have any of you ever heard of the magic fringe the magic fridge was on the highway between our area and canberra and everyone who was evacuating and all the fire crews in the fire engines had to pass the magic fridge either to get to safety or get to the fire now the magic fringe was just by the side of the road city at all and there was a big sign on it and every time you open the magic fridge it was filled um, with cold soft drinks and cold fruit juice and these does wonderful cold bottles of water and it was always full and always cold and no one ever knew how the magic fridge kept cold drinks but that's one of the things about a fire or a flood or other disasters, often what you remember is the kindness of other people, um, the people who offered us places in safety, the people who came in their cars and their utes loaded with food for the animals, and we never even knew their name because they had to just quickly drop the food and race out again before the fires approached again. We never even knew the people who helped us. And then it rained and rained and rained. And it is still raining now. And we had an enormous flood last night. And if you listen carefully, as I said, you can still hear the creek in flood and you can hear the rain on the roof. And the grass grew and grew and grew. And the animals very quickly gave to the refuge and started to go back to their own territory, including the fire wombat. Um, she wasn't a black wombat then. The rain had washed all of the smoke and soot from her fur. She was a dark brown wombat. Um, her paws had healed. Um, and I thought I would never see her again. But Danny Snell and I wanted to write a book about her. Um, so I wrote this. It took me only a day. Usually it takes me three years to write a book. But instead, I wrote this um, mostly in a day. But then two days later, I sent it to Lisa. 
Danny, who is booked up for three years, offered to illustrate it immediately. And within a few weeks, we'd sent it to the printer so it could come out and also raise money for the animals who had lost their homes and needed veterinary help and feeding after those fires. But I'm about to read the story to you, but there's an ending I couldn't put in the book. I thought the fire wombat might have a baby in her pouch when she was here, but she was so thin I wasn't sure. And also, too, um, she'd been through a lot and I didn't want to go poking around and, and frightening her. She was a wild wombat, even though she'd sit on my lap to be fed and to be given water. So I didn't ever know, and I thought I'd never see her again. But late last year, I was driving down the valley, and there she was. Um, this very fat, dark brown, glossy wombat. And next to her, there was this bushfire black baby wombat just bouncing around like that, just playing around around her. And the fire wombat gave me a grin. Wombats really do grin. A sort of grin as though to say, oh, hey, you know, we have met before, haven't we? And then she went back to eating grass. So it was a very, very happy ending for the fire wombat and for the fire wombat's baby who had sheltered here during the fire. So this is the story of the fire wombat. And it is a mostly true story, except the beginning and the endings have been changed very slightly. Early yeah, sorry, morning. Jack, Jackie, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, because of your your background blur, we're not able to actually see the, the book. It's being um, it's being blurred out. I'm not sure if maybe you could uh, sh just maybe hold the book up closer to yours to to your. Um, I'm not sure why that should be happening. Usually the background is quite clear. Uh, okay, maybe um, you have your um, your background uh, blurry image on. I'm not sure, but anyway, if you did, maybe if you if you held the um, the book a little bit closer to your uh, to your uh, videos thing, it might it might show up better. It's just blurry. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's, it's okay. Maybe blurry. maybe we'll, yeah yeah. It's okay. Um, um, I don't think there's much um, we can do I unless will... you turn off your background. But I don't know if you know how to do that, so. We can just um, um I'm just in. trying to see um if I can um turn turn off the background. Um because it, it really should not be blurry. Um speaker gallery, um full screen. Yeah, um, if you if you go how to is, how is it? No, that's still going to be blurry. Yeah, it's okay, just read it to us and um we'll have to uh the the folks in the um I know in the in the gallery have a copy and and we can um and, and the, the, the attendees can can uh, can read a can read a copy afterwards. I, I think it'll be too too complicated to turn your your background off right now. So maybe just do your best, and we'll sorry to interrupt. Keep, um, keep going. Can you yeah. can you see me now? Yeah, we can we can see you, and it can make it out periodically. Go ahead and keep reading. Sorry okay. about that. Okay, well, I I will read it. Well, if um if you could show it, if that's all right, or maybe you'd like to show it. Switch it to you, and I will read. Hello. You, can you, you go, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. You go ahead and read, and the other and the folks in the um in the okay, gallery lovely. will uh okay. will will uh will follow we'll along. Show it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Er early morning, Earth is morning. Breathing heat, brown leaves, and smoke. The monster called the bushfire rope woke. Gray sky became its scarlet cloak. Fire's hunger swallowed day, color lost to black and gray. Trees grew flickering flame red hair, the wombat smelled the ash thick air. Other creatures woke and fled, spurred by age old pounding dread, a bounding tide of kangaroos, a screaming flock of cockatoos, goannas dug in termite mounds. 
echidna scratch dirt all around, the only safety underground. Australian animals have evolved with fires. Kangaroos can usually out-hop a fire. They just bound sometimes for days without stopping or drinking. Cockatoos send out scouts. If you've got cockatoos perched around you, you know the bushfire isn't going to come near you until the cockatoos fly away. Sadly, cockatoos can fly and humans can't. But you do know if the cockatoos come to the valley that you've at least got a few hours before the fire direction comes towards you. Goannas dug in termite mounds. Goannas dig deep into termite mounds where they're safe. Echidnas can dig straight down like that with all four legs. And they dig down, 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 down. So, and they scratch dirt over their quills. And their quills are pretty much fireproof. So when an echidna digs down, um, they can survive a bushfire. Koalas climb to the highest tree around or any other high point that's around. And usually that keeps them safe in the bushfire because most bushfires are only about um, one or two metres high. So the koalas are safe up there. But in that bushfire, even great big trees were exploding. And that's why we lost so many koalas. They climbed to the top of the trees. But in that bushfire, that wasn't a safe place to be. But the very deep wombat holes were. That was where the wombat fled. Others followed where she led to ancient tunnels cool and deep where even bushfire's breath can't creep. The world was flame, the air was black. Strangers, yet all huddled back. No one growled or tried to bite all through that fire-eaten night. And that was one of the extraordinary things of that bushfire. Animals like quolls, black snakes, brown snakes, pythons, animals which normally attack each other in disasters, they don't. Um, in bad droughts, I've seen a wallaby and a black snake drinking from a tiny puddle side by side. When times are bad, the animals have a truce there together. Sky blazed red as they crept out, gazed unbelieving all about. Everything they'd known was grey, a crumbling ash and smoke smudged day. Burning pores and sun crazed heat, no trees, no grass, no food to eat. The little wombat sniffed the air. Was there water anywhere? Stumbling through charcoal and pain, up the mountains, down again, days and nights of growing weak. And then at last, a stone dry creek. Head on pause, she closed her eyes and woke to crashing from the skies and found her nose near drinking water, dried rust roots and other fodder. She crept upon her charcoaled feet to find the strange food good to eat. So many millions of hectares of bush had been burnt that there was no food for the surviving animals. So People took helicopters with great nets slung underneath them, um, full of food like um, loosened pellets and sweet potatoes. And they opened the nets and the food just dropped to the sky. And volunteers walked tens of kilometres away from roads to put up mobile water um, containers so that there were water stations for the animals to drink. Because you can't put food and water stations near roads. If you do, you're teaching wild animals that food comes from humans. They'll head to the roads to find human beings and they'll get run over. 
So all of the food and water stations had to be many kilometres away. And all through those months, volunteers just carried water, put up water stations so that there would be water for the animals who survived. And of course, they also brought back injured animals to take to vets where they could be bandaged and they could be fed and looked after. Wallabies, betongs, kangaroos, all that seemed had smelled the news that all across the smoke-filled nation, there'd been a vast carrot migration. We've still got one and a half bags of the stud mix brought to us during those fires. There's so much for us now. The animals don't want the stud mix. That was just what they would eat when it was starving. People were coming from so many places. People were donating all across the world. I spent a lot of my time on social media, sort of auctioning names in books and whatever I could to raise money for the animals and for a local bushfire brigade. Though mostly the fires were just fought by volunteers and the people who live there. They, they just weren't enough bushfire brigades to be able to fight those fires. It was groups who volunteered together who really fought um, those fires in those years. Just as now in the recovery, um, it's been pretty much left to the people that live, live here to recover without any official help. Others flourished, those trees drooped. Joanna's feasted, eagles swooped. Grass trees blossomed, feeding bees. Native mice carried seas. Kookaburra's currawong slowly the bush regained its songs. The Australian bush has evolved with fire, or some parts of it have. Other parts just die in fire and don't come back again. So goannas, um, well, they love, they love dead, dead animals. So do eagles. Grass trees only bloom after bushfire. Native mice find all the seeds which have actually dropped from the burning trees and the kookaburras and the currawongs, the bush began to sing again, even though it was still burnt. There were birds again, there were animals. Until at last clouds tumbled high, once again a dull grey sky. But now the weeping sky gave rain, sweeping off black fire stain. The monster's heat and all its slaughter, defeated by the power of water. New leaves erupted from burned roots. Black seeds blossomed with green shoots. A burrow could again be home. And so she walked but not alone. And so that is the story of one very real wombat. But it's also the story of a wildlife refuge. It's also the story of a bushfire and the communities that went through it. It's funny, I was talking about the bushfire with a friend, well, well with three friends, in fact, who'd been through it. And we were all talking about the things that we remembered about the bushfire. We were remembering um, one of the schools. Um, in the November fire, a lot of the kids um, had been in the houses where people worked around them for 11 hours, trying to save the houses with the flames around them. Um, the kids were pretty shocked. So the school decided to just have two weeks of fun so people people would learn to be happy again um every lunchtime there was a sausage sausage sizzle but also there was music down on the oval and everyone had to dance including me and i was on crutches um what we remember in fact we remember the colors of the bushfire. I know it seems strange, but it was also extremely 
extraordinarily beautiful. Seeing that absolutely deep red glowing sky pulsing red and yellow, the red light over everything. It's only when I look back at the photographs of that time and I realise that they, um, all of the light is red. The colours changed of everything all around. Our world, torches can see through darkness. Torches can't see through black smoke. So we live just in this very, very small world for months just where we could only see a few metres around us. And pretty much it was um, completely filled with animals. And I said, even wild whiskers, who is um, a wombat who will bite me any chance she gets, so I have to wear gum boots when wild whiskers are around, even wild whiskers um, didn't try and bite me um, in that time. And then it rained. It rained and it rained and it rained and it rained. It was the most extraordinary storm. Um, it was a very hard storm for a lot of people because so much of their topsoil um, washed away. But here where the land is very steep, it just washed away all of the ash. It washed our house clean. We could reconnect our water tanks. The creek ran black for hours as all of the fire debris washed away. And then three hours later, it was perfectly clean water again. And the creek went down. And for the first time in four years, we could swim in this beautiful, clear, very cold rainwater. And it was beautiful. And that's also what I remember about the fire. But there were other things I learned in that fire to. When we first built here, before climate change, this area had never burned. We thought because of the rainforest and the kinds of trees around us that we were safe from bushfire. Now we know that nowhere is safe from bushfire. But we also know that we human beings are a very clever species. We can now build towns that are safe from tsunamis. Um, the Japanese tsunami um, was the reason that those were developed, where every town is surrounded by a wall that goes like that. So the tsunami goes up like that, and then the curve of the wall forces the water back again to the sea. We can build fireproof houses so the fire can go through and yet people can be safe. We can build fireproof shelters and walls so animals can be safe. Um, I've now got a fireproof, um, well, it looks across between a TARDIS and a gypsy caravan, but all of my really, really valuable books are there, not valuable for money, but because they're collections of letters from 100 years ago or photocopies, they're the material I use to research my book set in the past, and I'd never be able to find all that material again. So a man called Tom Coop designed a building that can survive any fire. And now we've got one here, and that's where the books are, and we could even put a bed in it if we need to. We've now got a certified fire bunker um, where we can go underground and the fire can go um, over us and the people in there will be safe. Um, we also know now how we can create fire breaks so that fires can be fought. But there is one problem. We've got, we know how fires can be fought now. We know how fires can be stopped. Um, one of the best ways to stop a fire is having enough cookouts um, and getting to the fire quickly before it spreads on, me, on many, many fronts. We know how you can have bush, bush fire proof houses, but we still don't have the regulations to do it. Houses are still being built 
that burn in cyclone areas. Since Cyclone Tracy in 1974, we had buildings that just look like ordinary houses, but they can survive any cyclone. And for quite a few years, it was a regulation. Every house built in a cyclone area had to be cyclone-proof. They can be flood-proof houses. In the Netherlands, there are whole suburbs where there are houses tethered to the ground by great big enormous chains. And as the water rises up, the houses go up with them. But not just the houses. All of the houses are connected by footpaths and by bicycle paths. So when there's a flood, it really doesn't matter. Your house is floated up, next door's house is floated up, and you can just bicycle out along these paths, and it doesn't matter whether there is a flood or not. And when the waters go down, your house and the roads will go down with it. Human beings are a very, very clever species. But often the people who make decisions about how we manage the land, how we build our houses, don't pay any attention to the engineers, the architects and the planners and the climatologists. Um, I think they're more interested in making money very quickly than protecting people. Our home is a conservation area because I believe it is our duty to care for the world around us. It is one of my greatest joys to care for the world around me. I find it tragic that as human beings, we don't do it. We are such a clever species. It's time we actually started Hearing the people who actually make a fish food for our planet. We know how to stop bushfires. We know how to survive floods. We know how to survive cyclones. This is the time we need to put it into practice. But the other things that disasters show us is that we Human beings are also people who help each other. You get mud armies going to help each other. You get tens of thousands of people who come to help um, clear away fire debris, to put up fences, to look after injured stock, to look after injured wildlife. There is probably nothing better than working with other people to help. And disasters also teach you that when times are bad, it's good to be able to learn to say, I need help. So other people have the gift of being able to help you. Yes, we do have disasters, but now we know how to prevent them. We know how to fight them. We know how to survive them. And as human beings, we also know how to help. Has anyone got any questions? So I'm going to ask about any of the wombats or anything about the fire, what could be Are there any questions about wombats or how wombats live or what wombats eat? Hi. I couldn't the animals and wombats lose their food. All of the food. How do How do they use their food? Now, how did they? How did they lose it? The fire burned. Oh, the fire! Um, the fire burned all of the grass, all of the trees, um, all of the flowers, all of the roots. When the bushfire went through, 
um, there was nothing to eat and there was no water either because we'd had such a very, very bad drought. So we were getting all of the animals that had escaped from, from the fire area. Um, we hadn't been burned, even though we kept getting fire embers we had to put out. So even though there was no grass here, we had water and we were able to put out dishes of food and then just great big large amounts of pieces and celery and other food, apples and pears um, for the animals to eat and watermelons and they had a choice of all sorts of food that they might they might like to eat. Maybe because of the children, yes. Okay. So, until they come to December? No, not till Sunday week. Oh. Not this Sunday, next Sunday, when the exhibition closes. Oh. 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 Okay. 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 Are there any other questions? One of the one of the funniest things I ever saw in that fire was when the reserve army was called out to fight the bushfire down at Bega. And to fight a bushfire, you really need experience in fighting bushfire. And these men were reservists. And most of them had never, ever seen a bushfire before. And they had no idea how to fight a bushfire. But a woman who ran a wildlife refuge, which had been burnt out, she had escaped with all of her animals in care. And that was about all she escaped with in the van. She was down there at the showground evacuating and discovered there were hundreds of army reservists with nothing to do. So she organised them. She is a very, very, very organising woman. She got all of them to tramp out through the bush every day, connecting all of the injured animals, and then brought them back so they, they could have their wounds bandaged, their burns bandaged, but then they needed feeding. And she sent me the most wonderful photograph of about 200 blokes in army uniform all cradling wombats like this who'd been burnt, feeding them their bottles. And both the humans and the wombats had great big grins on their faces. Um, they were all enjoying this very, very much, much indeed. Um, it was an absolutely lovely, lovely photograph. But that is something about both fighting bushfire and looking after wildlife. Um, you need to know what you're doing. You need to be trained. You need skill to do it. Um, if you want to help wildlife, join a wildlife organisation. You can join them no matter how old you are and go to their courses, even though you may not be allowed to book up the wildlife by yourself till you're older. You can be trained now to know to look after injured wildlife or trapped wildlife. Um, or how to make water stations for wildlife. So when there's things like floods and bushfire, you'll know how to make a water station just using poly pipe and then fill it up every few days with water. You'll know what wild animals need to eat when their favourite foods aren't around. When there's a disaster, you too will be able to have a food and water station to help the animals. And after a disaster, whether it is a bushfire, whether it is a cyclone, whether it is a flood, there are always so many animals who desperately need help. And of course, too. But luckily, there are very, very good organisations set up to do it. So don't just, don't just um, donate old clothes and things like that. Contact those organisations and they will tell you what is needed and where it's needed. During those bushfires, um, one friend organised people, well, it started just in Sydney and then it spread around Australia and even overseas. 
and people were crocheting um, bags for injured animals um, to be held up in, um, a bit like hospital bags for wombats and wallabies and koalas, and they were crocheting them, and they were and they were sending them to her place, and she was distributing them. Um, there are so many things that you can do. Um, another organisation, the Children's Book Council of Australia, raised money um, for books for kids in the bushfire areas. But they were for books to be bought from shops in the areas that had been affected by the bushfires. So the bookshops could keep on going because people would be able to buy books there. And again, as I said, around the world, people were just so generous. And, okay, I've got a signal. We've now got five minutes, which means that I think that's a five-minute signal, um, that uh, it's time to... Oh, it's a, it's a way. One last question. Um, how much oh. you raise your brains by selling your book? How much were you able to raise for the um, the wildlife effective? Is that um, I have I have got absolutely no idea, and because the book is still selling, um, it's still raising money for the wildlife organisation um, that that it goes to. Um, I think on the first night, um, I raised $26,000 for the local bushfire brigade. But um, then I just, then for the next two weeks, I just gave up counting. Um, there's only so much one person can do. And when you're feeding hundreds of animals and birds, trying to keep the water system going, trying to get rid of the embers, um, sorting out the foods, um, and quite a lot of other things that were happening during those three months of those fires. Um, it was as much as I could do to actually just keep the bids because I was auctioning all of those things. I couldn't even keep a list of who bid the most. So I just had to trust people who said, oh, look, my bid was the highest. Um, and I've been putting in names of wombats ever since into the books because most people wanted to name a wombat in one of my books or a character in one of my books. So I've been adding those, which means that all of my books probably for about the next five years are going to have to have wombats in them. Um, but I've, I've no idea how much this is raised. I've no idea how much um, the book flood, flood, flood raised. Um, it's the publishers who sell it and they arrange the donation to the, to the organisation. So um, I, I've, I've never even asked the figures to find out how much how much money was raised. But still, while the book continu continues to be read and bought by people, um, the money will keep going um, to the Wombat Rescue Organisation. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was amazing. Really lovely. Beautiful story. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Zoe, I think maybe you want to introduce um, uh, oh, to just say hello. Cameron and, um, and uh, maybe she can talk a little about the workshop and I will post uh, the URL into the chat. Thank you. Hi, guys. My name is I'm an artist and illustrator and I work just up the road in the valley here. And we're going to make some little posters with all of you guys for climate for the climate march, which is on the 25th of March. So but the, the kids are going to make, well, they've got a choice of things to make. They can make a kangaroo poster. I've got one for you, Jackie, in a minute. They can make a, there's a little plant <laughs> poster. Okay. I, haven't, I haven't got a wall, but some one of the kids might have to design one. This is a koala poster that they can do. Or they can make up their own. I have a friend's daughter who did this with me last weekend and made a little uh, oh, yeah. her own. She designed her own koala. So we can do any of these and we're going to get started and we're going to use cut paper. We've got scrap paper. We're going to cut it all up and stick it, stick it down to make the posters. Okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank, you. I'm, I'm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank, you. thank you so much. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.
Bye. Bye.